All right. Welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. This is Rachel Marshall with my co-host Bruce Weiner, and we have a special guest with us today, and that is Gary Boomershine. So Gary, welcome to the show today. Uh, I'm super pleased to be here and awesome. I love what you guys do, and I'm really hoping that I can add a lot of value to your loyal followers, and this should be a lot of fun. I'm excited, especially around the topics that you guys are coaching and sharing to a large audience. So this, I'm ready to go. Rock and roll. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary. Well, let me just share a little bit of background information about you, and then I'm going to have you share your story because it's always better coming from you. But if you are in a position today where you're a business owner and you're saying, I want to find a way to scale my business and really grow from where I'm at now to building that freedom and the financial freedom that I really want in my business, this is going to be a really key conversation for you. Now, Gary is in real estate. He's in the real estate space, but everything he shares is going to apply much more um, on a principal level to what is happening in any business as well. So he's the CEO of realestateinvestor.com. He's created software to help you grow a real estate business, services to scale your income, and coaching to help you achieve the freedom you deserve. Super congruent with everything that we talk about here at The Money Advantage, and we're really excited to have him join us on the show. Bruce, do you have anything that you want to share before we kick into Gary's background? Yeah, I think uh, I think our listeners need to stay listening. Don't think, oh, you guys are having another real estate guy on because this is not just another real estate guy. This is an entrepreneur that ha- happens to do real estate and then also helps a variety of other people get into that entrepreneurial spirit with an educational type of of program so that you're going to know why you should uh, think entrepreneurially. And and I think we're going to talk a little bit about inflation, a little bit about Federal Reserve. And uh, I don't think there's a better way to stay uh, ahead of inflation than uh, being a business owner. Absolutely. Well, this conversation is exciting already. So Gary, tell us a little bit about how you came into the space that you're in today. And I'll just leave it there because I know you're in a lot of space. You're in business, you're in investing, you're in coaching and training and development. How did you come to all of that? Gosh. Um, yeah. So my, my, my journey really started, uh, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. I'm from the San Francisco California Bay Area, right in the heart of, grew up in Sil- the Silicon Valley explosion. Oh, wow. And um, my, my two generations of Stanford uh, engineers, and, um, and I actually ended up going to UC Davis as an engineer, as a computer engineer. But really, it started where my parents actually owned a real estate brokerage, and they were buying rental properties. And um, all of us kids got into the business. We built our own family economy. And that's something I want to talk about today, especially with where things are going. The family economy, I think, is key in terms of um, where things are going into the future, especially sort of this COVID environment, which I think, you know, changes the whole paradigm, right? Um, I was a licensed agent three weeks after turning 18. That was in 1987. I actually paid for college by holding open houses and door knocking. And then on the rental properties, I was like painting doorknobs and, (laughs) you know, changing light bulbs and all that stuff. It was really interesting because I really didn't love that. I didn't like the real estate thing. And I had amazing coaching. Uh, One little nugget right off the bat is what's directed me in my life is always, and I told this, like, what has changed my life? is really having good mentors and coaches. And as a business owner, I'm gonna say right off the bat, having a CEO coach, every professional athlete, every musician, everyone has a coach. And I think if you are getting, if you're gonna run a business, even Google, there's a great video from Eric Schmidt, who was the former, he runs ABC, whatever that crazy kind of thing is these days. Um, you'll probably know where I stand on some of this stuff. But Eric Schmidt, uh, actually, he, he came from Novell. He ran a multi-billion dollar company. And there's a video of Eric that said Google would not be where it is if he didn't uh, take on a coach. He had mm. the Silicon Valley coach, Bill Campbell. And that was a game changer. And so I had really good coaches. Um, this particular individual was from Macy's. He was like one of the most senior guys at Macy's and took me on as a mentor and said, Gary, the future is computers. And I think 
what I would recommend is get something in the computer space and then go ultimately into consulting, management consulting, and then go into sales. So I followed that path. I got a computer engineering degree. I then went into corporate America. I worked for the largest technology and management consulting firm in the world next to IBM called, it's called today Accenture. And, and then I did that for five and a half years. It was absolutely amazing. I learned tons of stuff at Accenture, uh, 80 hour weeks, 90 hour weeks. I learned how to work super hard. Been and there, done traveled that. All over the, <laughs> right. Traveled all over the world, but I never actually saw the light <laughs> because mm. we were in a building. And so mm. uh, I, after five and a half years of that rat race, swapping money for time, I decided I'm going to get into sales, into high ticket enterprise software sales. And so I ended up joining and I did four software sales. Uh, one company, I was employee number 12. It went public. Um, I was worth a ton of money in, in the dot-com thing. And at one point it was worth seven and a half million dollars right during the dot-com implosion. And then found out when the stock dropped that I had this huge AMT gain, which for I, I owed like more money if I sold all the stock, I couldn't even pay off the tax bill. So I learned my first true experience around the traditional stock market thing. I'm a huge alternative investment uh, believer. I like to buy physical assets. I like real estate because you can touch it and feel it. I love banking, infinite banking. We'll talk about all that. But it was really fast forward, eight, 1987, graduated from high school, graduated from college in 91, 92. And then it was 2004, fast forward 12 years after being in corporate America. My wife and I came together. We had two babies. We had a two month old. We had a four year old. We had a $700,000 mortgage. My wife and I went cold turkey, sold, you know, quit our jobs <laughs> and went into real estate full time. I don't recommend doing that, by the way. That's not a best practice to quit everything with a big mortgage and little kids and say, that's like Napoleon burning down the burning down the, uh, the ships, right? Ships, yeah. So, so 2004, May 17th, I became an entrepreneur and, um, and it was in the real estate space. And I will tell everybody what I found after coaching thousands of people and doing this for 17 years, that most of us that are probably following, we're looking for financial freedom and we're looking for a new life, a life of time and a life of pleasure. And what I've seen a lot of people do is they want that and then they get lost. And I got lost. I got lost for probably a decade because we have been indoctrinated into our system. I call it our slave system, right? Working for the man. And what happened is without clarity of vision of what I wanted, it's really easy to get lost and remanifest being a slave. So I mm -hmm. created my own business and it was successful, but now I'm not only working 80 hour weeks again, but I, I had a boss that I hated and it actually was me. And so it wasn't, for, you know, I fast forward, almost I disappeared and I got into real estate. I actually started realestateinvestor.com. So not, not just one business, I had two. I had a full-time real estate business, buying, selling, flipping houses, and then I actually started real estate investing, realestateinvestor.com, which was really a marketing engine for finding off-market deals. Because in real estate, the key is being able to find the deal, right? The whole thing. And right now in real estate, it's really hard to go find uh, deals because there's either on market, which means the MLS, multiple listing service through a realtor, or you buy foreclosures, or you buy directly what are called HUD properties. And that market in this particular part of the cycle is pretty much dead. I mean, there's no, there's no real good deal. So you have to go direct to the seller. So that's what realestateinvestor.com was. So my lesson that I'll share right off the bat is as an entrepreneur um, and building a business, every business needs a CEO. And if you're a CEO and you're doing $10 an hour work, you're going to have a $10 bank account. So as a CEO, you've got to actually run the business as a CEO. And I'll give you an example. And if you're going to build a pizza a company, let's say you're going to you know, get into business and I'm going to start a pizza company and you are the business owner, CEO, you're not going to, nobody's going to want to basically take orders 
go up in the back kitchen, make the pizza, right? Then come out with the pizza and then get it, they put on their delivery hat and then get in their car and go deliver the pizza. So the, the game is called leverage. So mm-hmm. businesses operate with a CEO. They leverage other people's money, typically, or their own. And then they leverage other people's time, money, and experience. And I've seen a lot of people get into real estate and they forget that. And so they basically do nothing more than creating a J-O-B. And I call it J-O-B just over broke. Mm-hmm. So it took me, I have something I'll give away to everybody. I did, I, I'm asked to speak a lot about realestateinvestor.com, but also how to build financial freedom using real estate as the asset class. And I have a presentation that I did right at the weekend that COVID started, it's about an hour and a half. And I've got a bunch of tools for entrepreneurs, along with real estate, that I'll give to everybody, along with a free copy of my new book that's coming out. And I'll make sure that I give that in the show notes for you guys. Cool? Absolutely. So, but I love real estate. I, uh, especially in this market, we can talk a lot about that. Real estate um, is, it's, it, you know, I think there's three main buckets that people should be thinking about in real estate. There's cash now, there's cash flow, and there's cash later. So cash now, a lot of people call themselves real estate investors in our business, and they're, they're really not real estate investors. They're real estate business operators because they are looking at cash now. These are people called wholesalers or fix and flip or rehabbers where they basically find a deal, they buy it, happens to be real estate, they fix it up, and then they sell it or they assign it. And that's a one-time transaction fee. So they do work, they get paid. They do some more work, they get paid. So if they stop doing what they're doing, there's no more money. And that's really a job. So that's the cash now. Um, I still do some of that, some of the stuff that I do. There's cash flow. And the cash flow is typically from rental properties, right? The borrowing the money and the cost of the money. You get one amount, <laughs> you rent it at a higher and you take a spread. And... I also, it's lending. I love private lending. We'll talk about that today. That's probably more of my favorite right now as an asset class. It's still around real estate, but it's a great, what I would consider safer returns done right. I can't say safe because that would actually be a SEC violation. So I would always say safer. um, And I do a lot of that. And then there's the cash later. And that typically comes from uh, inflation or appreciation and also from equity and equity buildup. So somebody else is paying the mortgage, so so you become ultimately having free and clear assets. And I think when you're looking at real estate, I always coach people look at those three buckets. And um, even Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett says, a real estate, a true real estate investor, somebody that has money, they buy a physical asset like an apartment or a house, and then they hold it forever and they take the, all the advantages that real estate has. Mm-hmm. There's an acronym called IDEAL. Plus, mm-hmm. one of the best things that's still available to us for the time being is the tax advantages. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so, so that's a real estate investor. That's a passive investor. There's also passively active investors. And then lastly, there's business owners or business operators. And so realestateinvestor.com mostly serves the business operator. Those are people that are full-time real estate. It's like their job and um, they're fixing, flipping, they're buying rental portfolios and they do it full-time. And um, so I wanted to be somewhat clear on that. That's excellent. Well, there are so many pieces that we could talk about and I wanted to jump in a hundred times and comment. So I did not. So uh, let me see if I can kind of pull some of these threads together here. So one is that you mentioned family economy. I want to come back to that um, towards the end here, but let's just stop at the idea of being a business operator because when you are in business, and we talk about on a regular basis, if you are just owning a job, you're just doing the work, then you are still trading time for money. That's where Kiyosaki would place you on the self-employed quadrant of the cash flow quadrant. And that's actually still over on the left side, which is still trading time for money. That's not as a business owner or an investor. And to be a business owner, you need to be in a position where your business is functional and running without you. And that's a challenging leap to make sometimes where somebody is saying, well, I got in 
to this business because I had a skill set and I wanted to be able to serve people, but then it's making the transition from being self-employed and over into, I have systems, I have processes, I have teams, I have, I'm scaling this operation and I'm in a place where now I can step away and the business is functional without me. That is truly becoming a true business owner. So I see a lot of the work that you doing with realestateinvestor.com serving real estate operators, business operators moving across that, that chasm, if you will. Is that a good explanation of what you focus on? Absolutely. Absolutely. And also a big percentage of our client base right now for realestateinvestor.com are real estate agents. Mm -hmm. Um, they're, they're basically, there's a whole new market right now called hybrid agents. And I'll explain that to everybody because there may be a number of them here. Mm -hmm. Uh, the hybrid agent. So the real estate agent, that model, because of where we're at technologically, most of the really bright real estate agents or brokerages realize that that money, that, that business is shrinking. It may be completely gone in a year, the whole agency. And because of what's going on with BlackRock BlackRock is buying, you know, entire neighborhoods, billions of dollars, basically, you know, what's jacking up the price right now. And a lot of these, these hedge funds, you also have what are called the I buyers. Those are Zillow, open mm-hmm. door offer pad where they they're, they're getting rid of the middleman. And so this hybrid market is where these agents are realizing, wow, just holding listings and listing properties is nothing more than a job. And it's actually, in a lot of places, it's a very low paying job and the margins are getting squeezed out. So they're, the hybrid agent are also getting in and they're basically either buying the property or they're listing. And so they can come up to the seller and say, gosh, Mr. Seller, I could, like, we could buy it all cash at this price or we could list it and here's what we think you would net in giving them more solutions. And that's about 20 to 25% of our uh, customer base. The, the, the other part are mostly business operators. And for anybody thinking about getting into real estate, um, there is a, there is a, a, one thing I'd love to share with everybody. And that is that people, they get into the business and you, the first thing I always coach people is you want to get super clear on your why mm-hmm. and your what, not the how. Everybody gets in and they're like, how do I do a rehab or how do I wholesale a property and make some money or how do I you know, X, Y, and Z built by an apartment. No, what you want to do is you want to stand back and say, what do you want? What do you want for your life? Right? What do you want your life to look like in five years, 10 years from now? Because at the end of the day, we're looking for financial freedom and a life of time, right? The most valuable commodity is not the money, the money, it's the time. Absolutely. So getting super clear. And then the what is okay i'm going to get you know a lot, a lot uh, the what is i'm going to use real estate as one vehicle and pe- people don't realize they're really in my book i explain this every single person everybody on this call is really seven houses from being completely financially free if they do it right and you can keep a job doing it I, in my book i'm like you could buy seven houses over the next eight years keep your job pay those mortgages off completely and you'll have free and clear properties and cash flow, passive income that would cover your lifestyle. And so when I teach, I'm like, so many people are focused on, uh, oh, I need to make $10 million, right? They're focused on some future number. At the end of the day, it's really the passive income. Robert Kiyosaki said, the definition of a wealthy person is when your passive income is greater than your expenses. Mm -hmm. And people lose that. They get into the real estate business and then they get lost. They get lost. Oh, I got to do a hundred deals a year. Oh, I got to build this big company. At the end of the day, if you, almost everybody, if they had 10 to 25,000 bucks a month in passive income, that would probably give them the the type of lifestyle they want. And so Mm -hmm. I'm more focused coaching on making sure you're clear on what you want in your personal vision and what that business vision looks like, and then drive everything. The how should be coming from that. The next thing would be the philosophy of keep the best, sell the rest. So if you're getting into real estate, you know, I'm, you know, we, 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 we bring deal flow to our client base because they're looking for great motivated sellers who want to sell possibly at a discount. And so you look at the property and it's like, keep the best, sell the rest, which means 
if you find 10 deals, you might want to keep two or three for your long-term portfolio, and then you can make money cash now and flip the other ones. Those are things that you don't want. And that's, that's, the, that's the crux of the whole thing, because I see a lot of people get into real estate, and they're like, oh, well, I don't have a lot of money, so I'm going to start wholesaling, because that's the easy way. You basically don't even need any money. You can make money out of thin air. That's called wholesaling. And then they're like, then I'm going to get into fix and flip or rehabbing and make some bigger money. And then I'm going to get into the rental portfolio and buy some rentals. And then I'm going to buy apartments. And then ultimately I'm going to get into lending and lend money. And I've never, I've seen very few people do that transition. They get stuck and they never leave and they never make any money. And they're stuck in a job just over broke, if that mm. makes sense. So getting super clear on your, on your why. And that's, that's what we spend on the coaching side is you got to get super clear on what it is. It's a fun experience, by the way. Like I'll, I'll tell you for me, I want to, you know, I have three businesses. My, my goal is to work three hours a day, four days a week, right. With debt free and to be have, be able to travel and do all the things. So I'm very focused on my time and having the passive income. And I'm never really focused on, you know, the $10 million. It, it's, it's like the old, um, you know, I'm probably old enough. A lot of, if we're all, all old enough, it's the Bugs Bunny cartoon where there's the carrot and the, the, the rabbit's running and yep. the carrot's always stuck, you know, and they're running. Oh, yeah. that's, that's really it. It's like, just stop, get clear on your why and, and why real estate and what, what is real estate going to do for you? And then the how and have a plan. And um, as I see so many people, they get, they get stuck in that trap and then they are trying to save pennies and nickels that are costing them hundred dollar bills, which means they, yes. instead of hiring people, instead of hiring some people at 10 or $20 an hour, they try to do the work themselves. And again, if you're doing $10 an hour work, you're going to have a $10 bank account. It's really just, it's the old paradigm. This could be I about 10, 10 podcasts here. So, um, <laughs> I love, I love where you're going with this. And we talk all the time about the reason that people don't really achieve financial freedom is that yes, so many people are looking at what is the net worth that I need this accumulation pile of money. I need 2 million. I need 10 million of net worth. And we are saying net worth really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Ultimately what you need is income. And if you even think about it, I mean, Gary, you know this, but our listeners, and you probably heard us say this a, a hundred times as well. The real thing that you want, even if somebody is working from that typical paradigm of saying, here's my net worth figure I need. Ultimately, you want to turn that into income after you retire, which we don't believe in retiring. So the whole idea is still about income. And so if we keep the why in clear focus, financial freedom is all about income. So you mentioned places that people can get stuck and the why there's so many pieces here, but if we just talk here, what does it really look like and mean to be willing to let go of those $10 an hour tasks or $2 an hour tasks in a business, specifically real estate, you can just talk about in owning a real estate business, but I'm sure these, these apply to every space where the entrepreneur is wearing all the hats, doing all the things, trying to not spend money. We say, don't step over dollars to chase pennies, but how does that work out in practical terms when you're scaling a business? Yeah, I think you have to look at the, as a, if, if you're, again, I'm going to be speaking to the business operator, your mm -hmm. real estate business operator. Uh, that business needs a CEO. It needs a, uh, and, 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 and that CEO or business owner should be doing $1,000 an hour work, $1,000 to $10,000 an hour work. And anything that's not that, they should start immediately being looking for other people that they leverage. Because when you learn real estate, the first thing you learn, one of the biggest values of real estate is the fact that we can leverage other people's money. You can get a bank loan, right? You can borrow at one rate. You can rent the property out at a higher rate, right? Or the fix up. And that's called a spread. And it's all a game. Real estate is nothing more than a finance game. And it's about leverage. So you leverage money, but then you also, as a business owner, you have to understand the value of leveraging other people's time. So if you're able to, <clears throat> let's, I, I have an, in, in the, what I'm going to give everybody, 
is a uh, is actually a tool. And what I show everybody is uh, in, in in this example, I say, you know, how, there's a very simple equation. How many hours a week do you want to work in in real estate? And most people will say 20 or 40. They're going to do it full time. And I'm like, okay, great. And at the end of the year, how much do you want to have in your bank account net? And so most people will say 500,000 as an example to start. And I'm like, okay, that's $250 an hour. So your, your time doing 40 hours a week is worth 250 bucks an hour. So if you're doing anything that's not $250 an hour work, as an example, sending out postcards and marketing, um, you know, dealing with the bookkeeping <laughs> and spreadsheets, those are $10 an hour work. So you're 250 and you won't be able to make, you won't have $500,000 in your bank account. So what you do is you actually leverage, you hire somebody and say, okay, how much of that time a week do you spend doing that, you know, bookkeeping or, or, uh, or marketing function? And most people will say like, 12 hours a week. And I'm like, okay, well, if you hired somebody for say 10 bucks an hour full time, now they're working 40 hours a week and they're replacing you doing it 12 hours a week. And now you're just going to manage them. You still have to manage people. So let's say it goes from 12 to two hours. I show everybody instantly that they just got 12 and a half weeks of their life back. They just have, it's, it's, it's the number. I mean, they could go on vacation for 12 and a half weeks. And they would have a huge ROI, return on investment mm -hmm. of that person. Just like return on investment on real estate or our investments, mm -hmm. you, have real, you have a return on investment of your, op, your, your people. And so most people, they get into the business and they're like, well, I can't afford somebody. That is an absolute lie. That is a, that is a lie. So if you, and I, and I see very few people break through it. I, I don't see anybody break through it. I, I can't tell you how many thousands of people I've met. And until they get this principle, they'll never break through. They'll never get to their goals and they'll never be above broke. So leveraging other people's time. Um, so that would be number one. You want to be focused as an entrepreneur CEO on the money-making activities. That's typically raising money. It's typically uh, uh, closing big deals. And it's usually hiring great people and managing great people. And um, those are the high money making opportunities in real estate. The money is typically made when you buy the property So finding the property, the rest of it are mechanics, how to actually, and there's mechanics of, how, you know, getting like, I love buying property and I, I don't really like renters, especially in this market right now because of COVID and you can't get them out of the properties. I like Airbnb. So when I'm looking at a real estate deal, I'm saying, Hey, I can buy it. <laughs> and what kind of return? And I get having it as a rental property, you know, vacation property. Mm. And so I'm looking at it that way. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if that totally answered your question. I'm also the nutty professor. People are like, oh, my gosh, Gary's like, <laughs> we could probably go for 10 hours, right? But um, it's, you want to be, you really want to be thinking clearly of like your time and your value of time and then leveraging other people, other, other people in your business, if you're a business operator. And a lot of people get into real estate and they're like, I'm going to do it first myself. And then once I make some money, then I'm going to hire somebody. That's a trap. If you can't actually, if you're going to get in full time into real estate, you want to hire somebody immediately. There is, that's how businesses operate. You need some operating capital and you need to be focused on money making activities and you need your people below you that are actually doing all of the staff work, right? All the stuff like, for instance, in a typical real estate operation, somebody needs to find the deal. That's typically marketing and a phone person. And somebody needs to be, you know, negotiating and closing those deals. Now, the, the salesperson, that might be you because you might be really good at it. And then the fix ups and all that other stuff really should be somebody else. You shouldn't be going in there and paint brushing the stuff. It's real estate is a leverage game. So you get that right, day one, then you got a future. I want to give an, another thing. This is a statistic. 90% of everybody that gets into real estate is out of the business within a year. 95% are out within five years. And some of them go bankrupt and broke. 
Now, that's not just a statistic in real estate. That's actually all businesses. That Why? I was going to say, that's across the board. Yeah. It's across the board. And I think it might even be higher because of the real estate cycle. So again, getting super clear, I was, I'm a faith-based guy and King Solomon said it the best. There's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. So don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> I always coaching when I'm coaching somebody and we're helping somebody, we're like, don't reinvent the wheel, follow the best practice. There's nothing new in real estate. It's a very simple game. And why I love real estate, it's a physical asset and it has value to it right now. So you can actually go and look at it and very quickly, you know, oh, this asset's worth a hundred thousand, right? Oh, this asset, you know, and it has income potential of, you know, 1500 a month. Unlike stocks, right, where there's, you have, you know, somebody else is making it up and, you, you know, instead of it being worth $100,000 that you could buy for 100000 or less, it's $100,000 of value, but they've marked it up 37. What is Tesla? Tesla's like, their PE ratio is like 300, right? Which means it's worth 100, you know, it's worth $100 and it's, you know, selling for like, you know, 50 million. So. Hey, Ga hey Gary. I, I, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, somebody tried to convince me the other day that uh, PE ratios don't matter anymore. So uh, you, so you should stop worrying about that. And and I said, yeah. wait a minute. So the price of something per its earnings, that's just basic economics. How can you tell me that's not? Go I mean, for real estate, the price of it, part of the what you bring in for the rent, the earnings, it means something. So uh, people have gotten all out of whack, uh, and they believe their own um, voodoo. Uh, I was going to say something else, but I think voodoo is a good oh. one. Well, uh, not only that, real estate, let's talk about real estate because I'm in the same agreement. Everybody's like, oh, this is the new normal, right? PE ratios don't matter. No, actually, <laughs> history is a great predictor to the future. So on the real estate side, real estate has been a seven-year cycle for over 100 years, okay? And it actually almost to the day. Uh, actually, to the Shemitah calendar, for us faith-based people, that's the original Jewish calendar. I mean, you can go back and look at the seven-year cycle for 100 years. It just happens that this cycle is the longest. I think we're at year 13. And it has always been, I've, I've been saying this, I'm probably the divergent, um, the contrarian. Everybody says I'm like the Peter Schiff of the real estate world because mm -hmm. I called I called the 2008 mortgage collapse in 2006. Mm. I was seeing it. I was on the foreclosure side and everyone's like, you're crazy. This is never going to crash. And then, of course, we saw what happened. It's always been a boogeyman event. It's not just been natural supply and demand for the turn of the cycle. It has been what I, I, I call it a boogeyman event. You, you know, people, it's just my term. It's been an artificial event, 9-11, the uh, mortgage collapse, you know, you have the oil embargo, you just go back to hundred years. It's always been some third thing. I call this one COVID, okay? The so COVID is the new boogeyman. So we're just, if, what I see, we're in the euphoric stage of real estate. And um, I'm seeing so many things that are very similar to 2008, but most people forget about those cycles. Everybody's like, this is the new normal full speed ahead. And I, and, I, and I actually think that we are going to see a fairly substantial correction, uh, mostly in the, uh, the states uh, where we've seen like the coastal states. I think there are some really great places that are still great buys. I love Omaha. Like I love Columbus, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Nebraska, uh, uh, o Omaha, Nebraska. I love the Carolinas. I think there's opportunities. We were just looking in Florida to buy. So I, I'm still out there looking for, you know, keep the best, sell the rest model. But I think places like California and Oregon mm -hmm. and some of the coastal areas are going to take a hit. I think there's going to be, I'm telling everybody from my perspective, we're going to see one of the biggest transfers of wealth that we've ever seen in any of our lives, even bigger than 2008. And and I think that, you know, we could be looking at the doom and gloom. I'm looking at opportunity. It's like, right, there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a buying opportunity coming. And then I think we're going to see massive inflation after that, where we're going to want to hold physical assets. And what are those physical assets? I think ownership of properties, preferably free and clear. And then first position, mortgages. 
private money mortgages. So I'm, an, I'm, I'm looking to acquire good properties now, typically free and clear if I can get them without a lot of leverage. And a lot of, I'm doing a ton of first position. Some people call it individual trustee investing, but it's basically, I'm like being the bank where I'm, you know, instead of Wells Fargo or Bank of America, it's the bank of Gary Boomershine. And I, you know, lend money on a house that's got a huge amount of, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the debt ratio of what I'm lending at is, is low. So the borrower's taking the risk and I'm taking less risk, just like the bank. And I'm getting a nice conservative or safer return, typically anywhere from like eight and a half to 10% right now. And it's a hedge against inflation too. It's a hedge against, I should say, it's a hedge against the market turn. If the market has a, a massive collapse, I'm sitting on first position mortgages where nobody can wipe me out. There's nobody else in front of me, if that makes sense. So um, hmm. I think I, I've been telling everybody, this is a time especially on real estate, to do what I call three Ps. This is a time to protect, it's, it's to pivot, and then to profit. And those people that are preparing for this massive transfer of wealth are going to have a huge opportunity. I think there's going to be a lot of people that are full speed ahead. They're going to probably get hit, like retail and, and things like that. So when you, that say, when you say transfer of wealth, you mean the people that have r- ridden this uh, – real estate bubble up and then that wealth is going to be transferred to people that can take the up that have the assets to take advantage of the downturn. Yeah. Yeah. I, my take is we are going to see right, right now the, the number, and I can't remember the statistic. We have one of the highest percentages of people that can own a house right now that we have in history. Historically, about 35%, 37% of the people have been able to own a single family property because of these ridiculous, you know, almost, you know, what is it, the Federal Reserve, it's, you know, it, it, the rate has been almost zero, which is, you know, <laughs> right. And then they mark it up so people can get into 3% mortgage, 4%. So um, the, I think the number right now is, is, is like almost 60%. Of, of America can actually buy a house. So I think we're going to see a, a situation where we're going to see the middle class squeezed out. We're going to have more poor people and then we're going to have more rich people. And I think this is an opportunity for us to be preparing for that, keeping the best, sell the rest, right? Getting super clear what we want and buying more conservatively. I think there's going to be an opportunity, like a great buying opportunity. There's no way with what's happened in COVID that we're not going to see it fairly substantial number of foreclosures coming our way. And that's going to be a great buying opportunity in the future. Um, The other thing, uh, this is, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I just use this. I use the history Mm -hmm. and what I'm seeing in the market and, and, uh, of, of, and the prediction, I think we're going to see, and the printing of money at unprecedented amounts, right? They're Mm -hmm. just printing. It's, did you see the Biden, uh, or whoever that was, get into the microphone and he's like, I, 1.7 trillion, I just gave you $1.7 trillion, right? They're printing money at unprecedented amounts. That comes with inflation. So I could see, you know, p- buying a property for 300000 that's worth $3 million in 10 years because of inflation. Um, so I think ultimately we're going to want to be in physical assets that are real estate um, for the long haul, but you, you know, I'm telling everybody, you do need to be able to sustain an 18 month turn. If the market turns it's like the, the musical chairs, when the music stops and they stop printing money, right. And they don't give out the free, you know, gifts, there's going to be, you know, a huge amount of supply. The government right now is holding back a huge supply of inventory, all that inventory from 2008, where Warren Buffett says those were weapons of mass destruction, they never fix that. So when that supply hits the market, that's, you know, there's a, there's a huge supply, which drives down the prices, right? And, and, and then followed by massive, in, massive inflation and appreciation. So I love real estate. I just think this is a really good time to be really crystal clear, buy right, right? Buy, don't, don't leverage up to the hilt. You need to be able to su- sustain, you know, if you're gonna have rentals, you know, don't be cash flow break even and no operating capital. 
to be able to sustain a period of time, just do it right. And Let's talk about that for a second. I, I'm, there's so many things we could discuss, but I think sometimes there's this temptation for somebody to say, okay, let me go ahead and throw all my cash into these deals. How does somebody, especially right now where you see the market going, need to think about having that reserve for challenges that may happen in their real estate. I know so many people ended up in really terrible situations back in 2008, they were leveraged. And for whatever reason, their, you know, their renters defaulted or um, the, the people in the homes were no longer having their cash flow. And so all of a sudden there were underwater in mortgages with no cash flow and in a situation where why is it so important to maintain reserves even if you want to deploy capital you want to invest as much as possible how are reserves so critical yeah so so the reserves i i if you've got a rental property as an example and you basically it's, it's the occupancy rate so the reserves are typically, hey, you've got, you got taxes, you got the mortgage payment, so you're operating expenses of that. And it's usually covered by the rent. So I see a lot of people, they're like, oh, I can rent this thing. And they're assuming it's always occupied. So go in with a 60% occupancy and say, hey, I'm going to have 60% occupancy, which means you know, you're only paid 60% of the time. I even do it more conservatively. I'm at 50%. Mm, hey, really? the market okay. turns, we have this dark winter. COVID comes, whatever it is, have a little bit more reserves. And I'm, you know, typically a prudent investor will have at least six months of reserves. Mm -hmm. I like 12. I like to have 12. Do I? Yes. And make, right. And in this particular market, and I see a lot of people that are buying, they don't have any reserves. They're like, oh, well, I have a job. Well, you know, the reserves are cash, like physical money in a bank account to cover those payments and all your expenses. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the people that are doing that, I think they're going to be, they're going to be fine. I just see a lot of people that are, it's like, you might as well just be going to Las Vegas and putting all your money on the stock, the, the, the slot machine or what have you. I, mm. I'm more of like real estate is a long-term game. And I want to shift a little bit. You want to, I teach people this a lot. You want to think like a banker, not like an investor. So a bank, there's a reason if we look, what are the biggest buildings on every street corner in the world? They're not a real estate flipper or they're the banks, mm -hmm. right? Because the business model works. Banks look at the downside. They're always looking at their downside. Investors are always looking at the upside. So I always teach people, any, it, real estate is just, it's just the asset class. It could be a widget. I just like real estate because every, it's everywhere, right? It's not like we're, you know, having to go build a manufacturing company or whatever, or build computers. It's like we have everything's for sale. There's stuff all over. You go, you know, I was at a, actually teaching at a conference. I said, look outside the window. <laughs> there, there's our product, <laughs> right? Um, we can see it. We can touch it. It's easy to value. And you can buy it typically for what it's worth or less as opposed to some th thing that's make-believe. So I... It's, it's, uh, it's really, that's the asset class. And you want to think like a banker, consider mm -hmm. the downside and, 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 uh, and real estate investors, again, they're always thinking, oh, the market's going to go up. Uh, this property is going to be worth X, Y, and Z. And that's where the risk is. Think like a banker. Um, in every, you know, I come into real estate and I'm like, okay, as a banker, what's my downside? What's the property worth? Um, you know, what is this going to rent for? What if I have, what, what, what's my, what, what's, what's my operating capital to run this thing? How much fix up? By the way, that can actually be, be done on the back of a napkin. It's not some massive, complicated spreadsheet, right? Back of, I call it back of the envelope. It's like if the numbers work out back of the envelope, we're, you know, we're, we have a starting place. And then do I have six months to 12 months of reserves if, the, if I can't get it rented? and and then go and uh and buy I'll, there's a lot of real estate investors that are doing this thing called the burr method and i won't go into what that means but they're buying a property and then they're ref, you know they're fixing it up and then they're refinancing it and sucking all the equity out right and 
And they're doing that over and over again. I know people that probably have four or 500 properties. So they think they've got a balance sheet of $10 million, but in reality, it's worth nothing. If the market turns, those properties are going to disappear instantly. And I think that it's a good, it's a good game while the market is going like it is. As soon as there's a, a little blip, they're toast. And I think that, um, you know, it's like, that's why I say cash now, cash flow, cash later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, look at Warren. What, what does Warren Buffett say? I like to go to, I go to, I like to go to smarter people than me, right? Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett, he's done pretty well, I'd say. But Warren, you know, it's like you buy low and you sell high, <laughs> right? If you're doing real estate, it's like, you know, buy low, sell high, uh, uh, follow the laws. And, and don't lose investor money. Those are his three things. And, and I was at, actually at his conference a year and a half ago, and I'm like, it was just brilliant. He says one sentence, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's life-changing. Just mm -hmm. follow what smart people do. And right now, we're in a euphoric stage of real estate. It is the high market. So if you're buying, just make sure that you're running the fundamentals and you know, not just jumping in the game. When the bar, you know, I remember, I've heard this over and over again, when the barber and the beauty salon and the cashier checker at the local supermarket is all talking about real estate, you know, we're kind of at the end of the stage. So I think that we're yeah. at that euphoric stage right now with all those fundamentals. So again, pull back, buy right, keep the best, sell the, sell the rest. Mm -hmm. Gary, Gary I'll, give you, I'll give you another indicator in the infinite banking world. Uh, there is a big push going on now to build uh, infinite banking policies so that the base is pulled all the way down to 10% and you, pe you build the PUAs to 90% so that you have as much as 92, 93% of the cash available. It's kind of the Burr method, I guess. And then you, then you actually rip all the cash out of it as immediately as possible and go put all of it into your buying investment properties. And this, this is, thing is escalating to the nth degree right now. And so all these people that are doing this have no reserves back and they're all they're doing is blowing up the bubble even further. And then when that bubble pops, they're, they're not only going to have nothing to, to fall back on, but they're also not going to have the cash flow to actually pay their premiums in their, in their whole life insurance contracts. And so I, I'm so glad that you said that because I'm seeing it in the infinite banking world, which I really, I really shouldn't say it's the infinite banking world because by Nelson Nash's principles, that's not infinite banking. That's actually something else. And mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if you, 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 you mentioned Mark Podowski, but so you probably know Russ, Russ Morgan very well. And Russ and I know each other from the, from the Nelson Nash think tank. So I'm seeing that, and I don't know if you have a comment on that because I know you know those guys so well. Yeah, uh, you know, I think it's 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 we're. I think remember I talked about the transfer of wealth. I think the transfer of wealth is going to come from those people that are doing that right now <laughs> to those right. people that are getting ready to take advantage of it. Right, and it, I it works. It works where. Um, it works when the market is up. I, I was actually, I want to share this and um, hopefully this is relevant. I was actually in a, I'm in, I'm in a number of masterminds. And another thing, if you're in real estate or an entrepreneur in a business, I would strongly encourage being in a mastermind. That comes from um, Napoleon Hill mm -hmm. and uh, it's a think tank. And, and so and I'm, I, last year I was actually in eight of them. It's basically a group of people, like-minded, smart people. Mm -hmm. you, want, you, you want to be around other smarter people than you. So I, I never want to be the smartest person in the room. So I'm in a room with 22 people in Dallas three years ago. And there was probably about a billion and a half dollars of 22 people over, it was over 3,000 units owned of real estate, apartments, mm -hmm. single families, in this room and over a billion and a half dollars of personal guaranteed money. Okay. The federal reserve, they had a federal reserve guy who specializes in real estate walk in and show us what the fed is seeing around the cycles. And, and, and the, the real quick thing is he was showing green 
around the country in markets is safe and red is, is, is risky. And he was showing the trends from 2001 all the way to current. And things were starting to go yellow and red, okay? So I asked this group, is this a time, everybody, to start taking chips off the table and preparing a bit? Or is this totally full, this is a new market, the new norm, and full speed ahead? And I was shocked because everybody in that room said, full speed ahead. This is not going to be like 2008. And I will tell you, when we came out of there, I started liquidating. So I've been liquidating assets and getting into a total cash basis. Um, so I'm very much in cash. I'm buying physical metals. I'm putting money into first position mortgages and I'm buying properties, as many of them that I can be free and clear. I, I think that's the prudent thing. There's no downside. I, I have a hedge against the turn. I'm still making great passive income and I'm prepared to take advantage of the market. Now I can't time the market. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this was three years ago, right? But the, 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 we have, we're on a clock and there's going to be a certain point in time where the clock is going to hit midnight. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's not very far from my perspective. This is not going to go another three to five years. So I, I think we're in, we're preparing for a great opportunity for those people that are prepared. And um, I, I I had this amazing, I was speaking at an event in Omaha, Nebraska. He was, uh, I think he's one of uh, Jeff Cohn is his name. Amazing guy. He was number one for Berkshire Hathaway in the country. And he just moved over to Keller Williams. So I was speaking and a young man, anybody less than 52, I call young. I think he was in his thirties. And he said, Gary, I want to tell you, you changed my life. And he said, and I really, and I, and I didn't, I remembered his face that he said, you remember last year you came to me and I said, Gary, I have all these p- properties. And he showed me a spreadsheet of all of those properties. And he was really leveraged up. And um, he said, what would you do? And I believe what you said about the market. And I said, oh, I would sell these. He had like 20 properties. And I said, I would sell these. Um, You're in a great market to sell them. And then take the money and just pay off these. (laughs) Turn them into free and clear. So you have some free and clear property. So this young man said, Gary, I have nine free and clear properties now. And I've got more cash flow than I've ever had. And my wife and I, and, and actually I've even, I'm not, working so hard. I'm only working a lot less. I got the two, I got two small kids and I got a lot of free time. And he said, you really changed my life. And I literally teared up and gave him a huge hug. And, um, Mm -hmm. and he, and he said, I'm just, I'm doing what you said, which is I'm, I'm really buying, buying the fundamentals. I'm flipping everything else because this is a great time to sell, right? You, you know, (laughs) you want to, what are they, what's Roth, Roth, uh, Rothschild, uh, the Rothschild family, the federal reserve, the dark empire, the evil empire, right? Um, so they said, you want to buy when there's blood in the street. Yeah. And you want to, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> buy when there's blood in the street. This is, to me, you, this is not necessarily the time to be, you know, taking high risk. It's like mm-hmm. pull back, get, get prepared for the market. So hopefully that helps. And hopefully that helps the listeners. At least it's my perspective and what I'm doing. And am I right? Am I wrong? You know, Henry Ford, what does his famous quote say? If you think, if if you believe you can, or if you believe you can't, you're right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. uh, So uh, I know there's people are going to listen to this and they're going to say, now, wait a minute, I'm going to sell my, and I'm not going to 1031. I'm going to have to pay all those, those capital gains tax. And to me, I, I have a very similar thing because I've had real, I sold one of my real estate properties last year and I paid the capital gains tax because the way I looked at it is the capital gains on this was 15%, but if I waited around, it was going to drop by more than 15%. The asset was going to drop by more than 15%. So it just seemed to me that uh, only losing 15% on the property made a whole heck of a lot of sense. Um, do you have any comments on, on people? Because I'm sure there's people going to say, oh, I would never sell my properties. I just 1031 in, into another property. Yeah, 1031, you know, talk to a really good CPA and see if there's a way that you can 1031 into, you know, I think this is where having good CPAs, also everybody should be using, utilizing a 401k and the infinite banking system because that solves a lot of those problems. Um, it's, you know, a good CPA should be able to help you ma- manage through that. I, you know, I think I'm not, 
I give give unto Caesar what Caesar's, <laughs> give unto God what's God, right? So I'm not really concerned, you know. If you're worried about it, you know, you can go like I like I like I I like lending, and if I have a tax problem, you know, I'll go invest into an apartment building or a storage that has good fundamentals, so I can get the tax depreciation on that asset class. So I think that just takes, hey, if you got a lot of money, you're worried about taxes, just get a really good CPA, right? Follow the laws and then pay unto Caesar what Caesar's. <laughs> so I'm not as concerned about that. Um, you know, I just, it's more around leverage, right? If you don't have the operating capital, those are the fundamentals. And so a lot of people get stuck on, um, on the tax thing. And if you can hold the property the long haul, keep it. If you're if you can't sustain a, a downturn or a change in the market, then to me it's 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 get it's get into a more conservative position right now. Well, I, I this... so my Gary, yeah, you're probably finding this more and more. And in, in, I actually had an a an Airbnb that the community decided they didn't want any more Airbnbs, and so they they said you can only go long term rental with it. And so I did the analysis and I said, you know, it doesn't make sense for this particular property to be uh, a long-term rental. It was cash flowing great when it was Airbnb and that's probably why you like the Airbnb situation. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and again, most of my language is probably more geared up to the real estate business operator because that's the, that's the world I serve with realestateinvestor.com. These are guys that mm-hmm. are mostly fixing and flipping and what I would consider a job in speculation. It's, you know, again, Warren Buffett, a real estate investor, is somebody that buys with his, you know, real estate and then they hold it forever. So I'm not necessarily saying, hey, if you can hold the property forever, hold the property forever. You know, I still have properties that I'm holding and I'll hold forever. But, you know, if you if you can't sustain a downturning market, you know, then you need to be balancing your portfolio a little bit. Um, that's my personal take. You know, I, I love historically, I love the game of Monopoly. And if we just think about monopoly, you got, you got to, you, you're buying as much real estate as you can on the board. Right. Mm-hmm. But you also have, you have to have enough cash, <laughs> you know, above zero, because when you have to pay Caesar, mm-hmm. right. If you don't have the money, you have to turn those cards over and you're, and you're, and you're, you, you, you get 10 cents on the dollar. So the same thing happens in real estate. If you can't sustain, you know, it goes to foreclosure or there's any distress you know, you might lose everything. So I just think this is a time to, again, protect, pivot, and then profit. I think this has been really, really interesting conversation. And we didn't even get back into the family economy and infinite banking. But one thing that I just wanted to share is as, as you're talking about being in cash, we see a lot of wise investors as well saying it's time to be in cash and the wealthy love cash because they have that opportunity then to buy when there is blood in the streets and when there is a fire sale of assets. And so holding cash is extremely valuable. And when you think about holding cash in the best storage tank possible, that's where infinite banking comes in because there's better safety, liquidity, and growth than almost any other place where you can put your cash and have it available. So you can access it and use it. That's why it's liquid. It's growing because of dividends and interest at far surpassing bank rates. And then you have that, uh, the safety component because it's never going to lose value. And so what's really interesting, I'm just gonna jump over that real quick. We're actually right at our stopping spot. So um, I really, really wanted to get into the the family economy um, with you, but maybe we'll have you back on the show in the future to talk more about that. Can you share a little bit more? What is the real estate investor.com? How can our listeners connect with you? And you had some free things that you wanted to give out as well. So I'll go ahead and let you do that at the end of the show here. Yeah, absolutely. And one little last nugget that I don't want to leave without clarifying. I actually don't like a lot of cash in the bank. So when I say cash, I don't like, I'm worried about the bank personally. So I, I take, you know, I want operating capital to sustain. And then I love you know, things like first position mortgages that give me income. So I don't, you know, I don't like cash in the bank. Uh, Mm -hmm. I like, I like, I like liquidity. I like (laughs) cash in my infinite banking policy. (laughs) And the infinite banking policy, I've been an infinite banking policy guy for a decade. So absolutely one of the best vehicles that I, that I know. Um, Yeah. Realestateinvestor.com. 
been around a long time. We're the largest marketer. We've done over 85 million pieces of direct mail, and I've got a large phone team that actually does all the, you know, that $10 an hour work so that people don't have to do it to help them find deal flow. It includes software and what we call services. And it's really a solution for real estate professionals, mostly business operators that are looking for a better life, a better vehicle, and a more efficient way of finding great deals. And our team actually provides software and then people faster, cheaper, better. And, um, and then we've got a lot of educational services. Uh, we've, I mean, we're very connected in the space. So it's like, hey, depending upon what you need to learn or to take you and scale or go to the next level, whether it's a coach, whether it's a connection, whether it's like, you know, training, you can come to us and we will help you where we've already vetted the best of the best. Because there's a lot of trap doors in real estate. And we love, you know, our whole mission is how can we create, how can we provide a measurable difference that impacts lives? And it's very family oriented of like, hey, let us focus on where you're at in your journey and let us help you and give you a path and help you create a vision and then go execute that vision. And so realestateinvestor.com, I have a podcast that's been running. It's Real Estate Investor Huddle. It's available. It's been out there with a lot of content. I love interviewing like you guys do. It's just been running for years. And then my free gift to everybody, um, you can text this, this, this phone number and just text. And you're going to get instant access to, gosh, a whole bunch of my best stuff uh, for free. And, um, awesome. and then you'll also be put on a list when my book comes out. I have uh, the Freedom Code, which is everything we've talked here, but a lot more specific. It's called the Freedom Code. It'll be out shortly in the final editing stage. But just text this phone number. You can put it in the show notes, 925 320 zero five seven five and put money uh in the text because i want to tell the team that if anybody does that then they're going to get a free copy of my book and again i'll repeat it one more time nine two five three two zero zero five seven five and gosh if we can help anybody in your journey specifically around real estate we'd love to do it i love to hear feedback um I do this because I've made a lot of mistakes and I've learned a lot and I love sharing so that people don't have to make those same mistakes. And if I help a handful of people, it's awesome. And that's, you know, it's the, the life of significance of, you know, I'm now over 50 and how can I, how can I give back, especially in this COVID world? It, it's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Gary, this has been just a real pleasure. And I said maximum an hour and I was regretting that. I'm like, maybe we should just do two hour shows when we have really great guests like you. So thank you for sharing just so much, um, just genuineness and authenticity. Thank you for just sharing so much rich value. And I think there's just so much, um, crossover between just our philosophy and the philosophy of our audience and our tribe here at the money advantage. And so I know that we will have a lot of positive feedback from this and probably people who will be jumping over into realestateinvestor.com as well. So thank you so much for being here today. Everyone, if you are listening, please take these things to heart. Go ahead and listen to this one twice. I'm going to do at least that myself and go ahead and connect with, uh, with him today with Gary Boomershine at realestateinvestor.com. So thank you so much, Gary. Um, in closing, I would love for you all to remember success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd and build a life and business you love.